Hey, what's up, y'all? Matt here with Hatch in another episode of Built By. Today's episode is interesting for two reasons. Uh, number one is because I get a chance to talk solar, which is a side of the home improvement industry that I've never really been exposed to. I've never really dived in to see, you know, how they operate, what their teams look like, uh, you know, how they partner with roofing, exterior, home improvement companies. It's a very interesting way how that all works out. So I get a chance to, you know, learn about that. And number two is because my guest today has one of the coolest backgrounds of any guest I've had on here, uh, which is that he's owned a professional sports team. So Brady Nelson was gracious enough to uh, accept my invite, hop on the podcast. He's the CEO and owner of Lumina Solar, uh, a solar company down in North Carolina. He was also gracious enough to put up with my questions, trying to learn a little bit more to dig in about the solar industry, which I'm sure some of you are kind of curious about um, how it all operates on that side of things. And, and he gives a really good breakdown, you know, of what Lumina Solar looks like, what their team looks like, their sales and marketing, do they have installers, how they partner with other companies. So he gives a good breakdown of that. And it's really interesting because he owned a business before he owned the Arena Football League team. Um, he sold that and then he started his solar company. So I wanted to dive into that time. If you think to the local sports teams, it's all about promotion. It's all about advertising. It's all about marketing, building teams, hiring coaches, all of these things. I wanted to pick his brain about what he learned from that time and how he runs his business now. So he's got some great answers. It's, it's really fascinating to listen to him talk about that experience and how it shaped what he's doing now. So without further ado, I want to kick this episode off because it's so awesome. Um, again, this is Brady Nelson, who is the CEO and owner of Lumina Solar. I hope you enjoy. Every day is an opportunity for you to learn something that sets your home improvement or home services business apart from the competition. Let's make today one of those days. This is a podcast for home improvement and home services marketing. This is Built By. So you've got to be adaptable. You've got to find a way to accommodate an uncomfortable customer. If you're not getting the home advisor leads in the first five minutes, you shouldn't even do it. Hopefully we're eating their lunch while they're trying to get back up and running. Brady, I would love to get just kind of a primer on... Uh, your background, how you got into solar, and um, tell me a little bit about Lumina Solar. Sure. So how I got into solar, um, coming out of college, I had been in the TV, like the Dish Network, uh, direct TV industry and selling and installing solar kind of all over uh, where my hometown is, Spokane, Washington. So Washington, Idaho, Montana, and had just been in that industry and especially when it was new, it was a great business to be in. Mm -hmm. um, as cable TV kind of became more dominant, it became less, less attractive, but it was a great run for a long time. It was a, it was a good business. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually one day, DirecTV made a partnership with uh, Solar City, who Elon Musk ended up buying and bringing into Tesla and his cousin started but they were offering leads for solar if any of your customers in these states were interested in solar we'll pay you this amount of money well the amount of money they were paying for a lead was more than we were getting paid to install a direct tv so i thought okay there might be some some margin in this business and started looking around and asking around and i knew a lot of people um, in the industry and uh you know i'd kind of looked into it and several salespeople who used to work for me were selling solar and, you know, I kind of picked their brains and asked them about it and went to, you know, being from Spokane, Washington, it was cold and snowy in the winter. And I went to a meeting in Huntington beach, California in the winter mm -hmm. and it was sunny and beautiful. And I said, all right, solar's for me. I'm going to move here and start up a solar company and see how it goes. Yeah. So that was about uh, six years ago when that happened. And uh, it's been a wild breakneck sprint since then. Yeah, it's crazy. So um, I that, you know, beginning of television, um, mm -hmm. I, I really want to dig into that a little bit later. But sure. just kind of seeing your, your background is kind of in that marketing promotions type area, um, which is a very interesting aspect for solar. But again, I want to dive into that a little bit. But 
Give sure. me, um, before we dive in, I would love to get just kind of a primer. So um, for any listeners like me that aren't familiar with how solar businesses operate as opposed to mm -hmm. um, other home improvement businesses, um, can you give me an overview of kind of like how you're how you're running so, uh, Lumina? Is it like a sales marketing installer type of team or what, what's kind of the, the yeah. overview there? Good question. Um, and that's actually an appropriate question. So solar usually does break right now. It kind of breaks down to two main, or I guess kind of three. When I mm -hmm. got into it, I was familiar with the dealer model as a ADT dealer, um, a direct TV dealer, a dish dealer. You're not selling your own brand. You're selling mm -hmm. the product and you get paid a commission. So that's how I got into solar was I found a reputable company that I could sell for and I would develop a sales team for and we would sell and basically get our commission. And that was my business. Um, but the more and more and more I got into it, the more and more I wanted to control the, the customer experience from the start to the finish, control the money, mm -hmm. control all that. And I got into that really the end to end. So now we have an in-house sales team. Um, we sell, we permit the jobs, we install them, we do the inspections, and we do it all in-house. But the industry is certainly broken up into, you've got um, install-only companies that only do install fulfillment. You have most everything you're seeing online and advertising for solar companies are marketing companies. Um, that might be similar to other home industry, you know, home improvement, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, sales only, and then a very few, a smaller percentage, I would say, are um, everything done in-house, just because it's easier to specialize in one or the other, and doing everything is, is complicated and takes time and experience. But um, for us, you yeah, know, that's kind of how we've done it. Yeah. Now the national, like the big national players, like you hear in solar, um, Solar City was one. Uh, they got purchased. They're kind of out of the business now. Mm -hmm. um, Sunrun, um, Sonova, those are largely finance companies that they offer the financing to guys like us. When we sign up a customer, or a customer wants to go solar and they need financing to go solar. They're really, truly, when it all comes down to it, they are a lender. And gotcha. they lend the money, buy the customer, and go that route. It's very interesting. It's a very yeah. unique industry. And it's it's interesting because, you know, as you know, we talk to more solar companies, and you're actually the first person from the specific solar uh, side that I've had on the podcast. So okay. um, it's very interesting to see all the different dynamics of, of what people are doing. And like some companies are just owning, like you said, that that entire like, uh, you know, sales process, marketing process, and then kind of handing the job off. So it's interesting. Yep. And um, do you find that like, they tip they tend to partner with well, like well established roofing companies um, to kind of get those those jobs done or um, do they you know outsource with their own labor well the solar companies or yeah. well you need an electrical license in all these states mm -hmm. and it seems to be a very especially in the southeast where i'm operating now i started in california but i'm in the southeast now north carolina mm -hmm. it's a newer industry and very few people have the skill set to do the, the installations. Right. Um, but typically a crew, when you're installing a house on a roof mount solar install, you're typically a four man crew, two roofers, mm -hmm. an electrician, and kind of like a project coordinator on the site who um, does everything. But yeah. just recently um, I partnered up with a, another roofing company um, that they are going back to their existing customers and trying to add solar on top, a warm handoff. And it's actually worked really, really well. Yeah. It seems like a logical kind of upsell for, you it know, really is. Yeah. Yeah. And they're yeah, on the back and they're making money back. The homeowner's making that money back on, on the solar savings. So it's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. So, um, that's awesome. Um, you know, in terms of the industry right now, there's a lot of people mm -hmm. that are feeling that like the squeeze when it comes to, you know, labor shortages, material mm -hmm. shortages. We were chatting about this a little bit other, the other day, but um, from where you're sitting at on the solar side, are you feeling the squeeze at all or um, how, how's business looking for you? 
Um, right now, it's looking good. Ironically, um, when we were talking last week or whenever that was, a couple of days mm-hmm. ago, can't remember. Um, didn't really see too much squeeze, but the gas shortage that just popped up out of nowhere is just, yeah. it's interesting because it affects the whole supply chain. Yeah. So not just us going to the project sites, but our suppliers are worried if they drive out to deliver inventory, they can't get back. True. So you see this major ripple effect from the Southeast, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. Mm-hmm. And it's like a, a small thing of just fuel. It's an interesting, uh, interesting wrinkle, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I'm interested to see how it's going to go. Our industry has helped a lot with tax credits mm-hmm. and at the end of the year, at the end of 2020, there, um, a customer's project. If you spent a hundred thousand on a project, $26,000 of that you could receive as a tax credit. Oh, wow. And that was set to expire at the end of 2020. So it got renewed, but a lot of big um, projects, thousand million panel type projects um, that really move the panel market nationwide were sold and trying to get constructed before that expired. Yeah. So we have supply right now. Um, because a lot of people are trying to take advantage of that tax credit. But as we keep going, um, it's a global, it truly is a global economy. All the parts for panels and batteries and inverters, all the parts, no matter what anyone says, they all come from Asia. Mm -hmm. And even if they're assembled in the United States, all the raw materials, everything comes from Asia. So um, we weren't affected by the uh, Suez Canal fiasco but um yeah. we order you know months and months in advance yeah, and yeah. we pay when it gets here so we'll That's see yeah it's it's crazy yeah. you, know, you mentioned that gas shortage and you know being here down in the south and yeah it's it's cra- everything is gonna start getting a little harder let alone like lumber being as expensive it is to, out of control as it, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so in more fun news, <laughs> I do want to dive in a little bit because, um, the reason that I reached out to you and I know we've talked previously in the past, mm-hmm. um, you're, you're, you've owned a sports team, you've owned a arena yeah. football team, which right. is much a unique perspective, um, for any person I've ever talked to in the home improvement industry, because you think about owning a sports team, it's really all about, marketing and promotion and, and really, 100%. yeah, knowing what you're doing. Cause if they're not winning, you got to put them in the seat somehow. So give me a little background on y- your time. It was the Spokane shock. Uh, yep. tell me a little bit about, you know, your time with them, um, and kind of, you know, how you got into owning a AFL team. <laughs> sure. Um, so really in 2005, uh, I got into the arena football two league. So AF two is what it was called. And mm-hmm. at the time there was about 28 teams in this league. And the AFL at that time had 16 teams. So that this overall league had 46 indoor arena football league teams. The players are basically guys that are college rosters and the guys who you're watching play in the third and fourth preseason game of an NFL preseason who are on the bubble of making the roster. Mm -hmm. If they get released, there's really nowhere for them to go if they intend to keep their careers alive. So everybody thinks they're going to the NFL. I never met a player who's going to college who that was not their dream. I mean, Mm -hmm. they just wouldn't stick with it if it wasn't their dream. So they all want to go to the NFL. Of course, they all want to reach the highest level. But after... The NFL season ends and next year's draft gets going and the free agents start getting signed. And last year they were a big man on campus. And this year they are quite literally living on someone's couch. Yeah. Uh, they want to keep playing. So those are the kind of players that are really hungry. They're super motivated and they don't get paid a lot. It's for the opportunity to keep playing. So anyway, mm-hmm. um, I had been running my satellite TV business for a few years after college. And um, I just wanted to, I I just thought it would work. I'm really kind of like you mentioned, I'm really a sales and marketing person in the hunt for a product to sell. And I felt like 
where I was in my market, Spokane, we had no local pro team. We're, I'm wearing a Seahawks jersey <laughs> here or a rain jacket, but we're four and a half hours from Seattle. We don't have an MLB team, NFL team, uh, NBA team, NHL team. We didn't have a pro major team and we didn't have a major college within a hundred miles. Yeah. Now, since 2005, Gonzaga University has kind of taken the national stage, but still it's a very small school and they only have basketball and that's all done by March. Mm -hmm. So from March until fall, there's really no major live sports. And I thought, shoot, football's popular. I bet you if we had this caliber of team, guys who are pros, who are college stars, I bet you if we put these guys here, got a team here, Mm -hmm. um, it'd be a success. Yeah. So I approached the AF2 and at the time I was the youngest pro sports owner in the United States. I was 27 oh, and <laughs> yeah, bought the franchise and did as much research as I could at the time without having really any experience in this kind of a thing Yeah. and rolled out the team, kind of launched the team and just started realizing we're going to need some more money. So I said, <laughs> all right, we got to start selling tickets and um, hired some great people. And we started selling. Um, we did anything for promotion possible. We were game for any stunt, any live TV, any radio, you name it. <laughs> we were not above doing it. Absolutely not. <laughs> so we started, um, we got a little momentum in the season runs from March 30th, roughly to the end of the summer, August. Yeah. And we caught a little momentum as we were the number one um, ticket seller for like January or December. And we started really pumping that up that we had sold more than every other team of the 28 teams in the league, even though we were a rookie. Yeah. And everybody, it just caught momentum, caught fire. And our very first game we played at home, and I remember it very clearly, March 30th, 2006. We had nine, our, our, our arena holds 10,200. Mm -hmm. And we sold 9,300 something tickets. <laughs> and so we were, it was a huge crowd. It was rocking. Yeah. I mean, it was total insanity. And I was like super depressed because <laughs> I expected us to have a sellout. And my heart was set on a uh -huh. sellout. But the uh, arena director brought me to his office and he showed me a list on the wall of predictions for opening opening night. All the pros in the sports business said 200, 400, 177, 82, like crazy <laughs> low numbers. And I was so mad that I was being disrespected like that, that um, we worked extra hard. But since that opening night, we had 9,200, 300, that range. We sold out every single game for the next eight years in wow. our arena. Yeah, pack sellout. Um, and it was a, it was an awesome, awesome deal. So um, it was, it was great fun. It was, a, it was truly crazy owning a team. Mm -hmm. unlike a affiliated baseball minor league team where you know, you're giving your players and winning, losing doesn't really matter. Um, in this, you go and find your coaches, you find your players, you recruit them just like you would in college. You sign them, you get them for one year and you try to win every single year. So we were real successful and mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, it was amazing. It was fun. Yeah, that's all. That's honestly like one of my dreams one day is, you know, being like a GM like that, being able to like find talent and, and, oh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Own a team. I imagine the stress levels are, are, are the stress compared. levels are off the charts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because you don't control really anything. Everything that you can control, you already made those decisions months ago mm -hmm. in terms of what are you doing to market the team and signing the players. Once it gets there, um, there's very little you can do except for try to be a therapist for your head coach <laughs> and your general manager. And I had a player, uh, he played in the NFL. He's a second round pick for the chargers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
they stayed in company housing. We would rent them apartments and stuff like that. And he literally burned down an apartment complex. He hit, he had a mental problem. Oh, Sad. Nice. But, uh, those kind of things, those, those kind of things happen. Um, yeah. Great guy. But uh, those are the kind of things that just pop up out of nowhere. Yeah. And yeah. the other team owners are trying to squash you on and off the field. <laughs> and you've got market conditions and you got labor unionization issues so yeah. it was true it was a great way to uh gain experience um and then i sold the team uh in 2014 uh mm -hmm. a private equity kind of a guy out of seattle uh made an offer for the team and i sold the team and then shortly after that i got into the solar business gotcha so that's that's so interesting and really why I wanted to connect because, you know, how did that time, I guess you had been a business owner and then you yep. owned a team, which you had so much more, you know, f f like things to worry about really, um, you know, being the GM owner there. And then now you, you own a second company after that. Yep. Tell me a little bit about how you approached that second business, Lumina Solar that you're, that you're at now. Mm -hmm. Um, with that experience and, and how that kind of shaped, you know, how you're building your team and how you're approaching like sales and marketing. That's a really good question. Um, I didn't know. I mean, my satellite TV business, primarily, this is in the early 2000s, 2002, when that started, we were primarily a door to door lead generation. We knock right. on the door, sell the customer, install them. And a lot of the traditional marketing, I had tried direct mail, um, I tried radio, I tried TV, but it was really transitioning from uh, into the internet age, which sounds like a, a different time, but it was a different time. Mm -hmm. It was before Facebook, it was before MySpace, it was before YouTube. and But I was kind of in the thick of it, trying to figure out what works every single day while this transition was happening. Mm -hmm. So I had kept that business going the whole time. I was still doing it after I sold the team, but after I sold the team, I was looking for something more um, to sink my teeth into. And I didn't really have a great product, a platform that I could take advantage of as a team owner. So I was really thinking I need something. If I'm going to spend the rest of however much time doing something, I want it to be impactful something mm -hmm. I believe in something that's gotten good margins and I don't know anything. I, I don't even know what's out there, but I do know about this. Let's go figure this out. So I dove in, um, brought some of my old veterans who worked for me and said, let's go to California. Let's knock on some doors. Let's see if we can figure something out. And it's seemingly a big difference from owning a football team to, going out in the field with your guys and knocking on some doors. Um, it's humbling mm -hmm. because nobody knows who you are. You know, when you're in your town, you're kind of famous, like mini famous, like even mm -hmm. though you're a minor league team, people loved it. We had sold out crowds. We had, we're on TV. I mean, it, it was awesome, but you start over and then you just cut straight to the heart. We just got to find what works and how we service it. Um, and, I do feel like all of my experience, actually, particularly digital marketing mm -hmm. that I took from Facebook when that started and seeing the the slight changes in their advertising program over time really helped me to hone in on what I'm doing now. I mean, it's, it's a good decade worth of Facebook and Instagram marketing experience and seeing what works to, to finally get to, you know, where it's actually quite profitable. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. I was I was going through uh, some of the old Spokane uh, YouTube videos and I mm -hmm. was like pros versus Joes, where you were running routes, oh yeah, with players and stuff. And <laughs> you know, you you have a TikTok too, which we were talking about the other yep. day. But all of these things are are founder led, so you're really the face of the company, which is yeah. really interesting to me because I I don't really see a lot of home improvement companies where the owners are the one in front of the camera, unless it's like one of those 30 second testimonial videos and yep. hey, this is Bob and it's the logo and that sort of thing. But uh, you're out there and you're promoting your business. Um, tell me a little bit about that that approach and, and 
is it out of necessity or is it out out of just because it's working and, and this is something that you kind of love doing? I think that um, ultimately, like in a home improvement project, people feel like they want to deal with the top mm. and they want to know who that is. And because you can create a brand overnight and I mean, honestly, you can get fake reviews and you, you can make yourself look like a big company. People want to kind of know who is there. If I have to go choke somebody, who's it going to be? It's going to be this guy. <laughs> and I mean, I kind of learned that with the sports side, it's much less, you know, Jerry Jones, Robert Kraft, where you sit and people do stuff. You're more like Dana White mm -hmm. and Vince McMahon, where you got to be out there because people come and go, your employees come and go, your players come and go, and it's your business and you're going to be the one sticking around that people want to see. So it's actually a little bit uncomfortable for me, but I feel it's the best, best way to do it. I don't, I, I would prefer not to, um, I don't post a lot about my, I just, I don't really want to, but yeah. it works and I, and people want to know who they're dealing with. So right. I try a bunch of different stuff and I go in spurts. Well, I'll, I'm like, I need to post every day and I go for a couple of weeks and doing that. And then I'm like, oh, I don't have time for that. And I'm sure every owner you're talking to has had the same exact experience where mm -hmm. um, they're so busy running their business. They don't have time to kind of work on their own personal brand, but it's very important. It's very valuable. And yeah. whatever you're going to do, I, since I've, since I've transitioned from completely different industries, your reputation from one industry to the next industry comes with you. So, you might as well build on that and bring it with you and um, cultivate it while you can, because if they trust you in something, they're going to trust you in the next thing you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I always think back to the Wizard of Oz and the man behind the curtain mm -hmm. thing. You, yeah. It's just a normal person. And, you know, sometimes if you put on a and, and try to make it seem like you're something you're not, it doesn't build that credibility and that trust that homeowners, like you said, are looking for. So it's a really interesting approach. Yeah. And I, I like to be, so I, I try to generate leads and appointments for my sales team, but I like to be out there too, because I like to be in the weeds mm -hmm. and hearing firsthand what are my customers saying today. Um, I like, I am a salesperson. I like to be selling. I like to be closing deals and I like people around me who like the same things. And that's to me, that's how we become a successful company there. Nothing happens unless it's sold and we have the greatest product in the world, but if, nobody is buying it. It kind of doesn't matter. Yeah. So yeah. I like to be out there and then, um, I run a lot of ads on the internet and people mm -hmm. always respond and they ask me personal questions cause they see me on the ad. So I get back to them and oftentimes it's not me going to the house, but I let them know someone else is coming. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, you know, you, you mentioned ads there. Um, I have just, you know, two more questions, but I am curious, um, what are what channels are you finding working best for you right now? Because you're in a you're in a very interesting position where uh, you know with the tax credits and things, and you can offer value yep. right back to the customer. So, are there any channels that you're using that you're finding success with, or any other you know outlets that you're not seeing as much success with? Yeah. So in terms of the, so we still do door to door cold contacting, mm -hmm. um, and that's probably thirty five percent of our business, I would say, gotcha. where I'll have a young guy who wants to transition into being a, a real sales closer mm -hmm. and they'll spend some time on the doors. And I, I believe that's a great way for someone to learn any business is talking to people and it chews them up and spits them out. And the ones that survive are, are your killers for later. Yeah. But, um, in terms of the internet, Facebook has been amazing for me. Um, Facebook and Instagram, I would say prior to about two weeks ago, um, Apple iOS on April 26 makes it so you can opt out of tracking. And yeah. I wasn't really sure how that was going to affect lead generation, but it affects it a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's the magic of Facebook is they track you everywhere and you can get leads. So yeah, anytime someone says solar or they're thinking about solar, um, that shows up in their Facebook profile and you can target them and the cost of leads 
was much cheaper. Yeah. Um, but I've had great success with that. Um, I have, I don't use Snapchat personally, but I have, I mean, I have an account and I think I kind of understand the basic idea. Mm -hmm. have tried advertising there and I've had limited success. Um, I'm looking for homeowners really 35 plus. Mm -hmm. Um, so the demographic on that's a little lower, but the people, all that matters is the eyeballs that you're targeting and you can find them anywhere. Um, tried that. And, uh, I've tried LinkedIn advertising. Haven't had a great conversion on that because almost like people aren't browsing and scrolling like they are on the other channels. Right. Um, my Facebook rep told me that the average person scrolls, um, like on a six six inch screen, they scrolled the equivalent of the empire states building every day. So they're like, you just got to stand out in that feed. I'm like, wow, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I, I, and then, yeah, I was going to say in TikTok, TikTok is a new, new channel. And even a year ago, I mean, I learned about it from my teenage uh, daughter Mm -hmm. and I didn't understand it, but I started watching, trying to figure it out. And just the power of it was so massive. I thought, wow, this is, you can actually become something overnight. Um, But the advertising platform there is really, really tough to deal with. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not mature yet at all, which makes me think it's even going to be more valuable when it, when it rolls out. So I'm, I'm a believer in that. I actually think it's really interesting. It's, it's algorithm finds what you're interested in and it will show it to you and it's incredible. So I think that's going to be big. Um, I haven't used Twitter before. Mm-hmm. I do a little bit of Google. I need to be better at that, but that's really crowded for my industry. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Yeah. That's interesting. You're, you're really, you know, all over the the place, testing, experimenting, seeing how it works, what doesn't that, that that's at the core of what, what good marketing is. So that's awesome. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that Empire State Building scroll. I get those updates from from Apple that's like how much time I spent on my phone like the previous day. I was like, scary. It's five hours. It's five hours. It's crazy. I didn't even realize it's it. It's scary. Yeah, yeah. It's oh, so scary. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. But yeah, I think the, a healthy curiosity and tinkering on that, um, you have to have that or mm-hmm. you're going to be beholden to – people that either work for you or you're just gonna be left behind in the dust, unfortunately, as, and I think we've seen in this pandemic, mm-hmm. I, when this, everything started locking down, I think everyone was gonna be terrified of what, is anyone gonna have any money? I mean, what's gonna happen in this thing? And I kind of cranked up my ad budget. I'm like, well, people are gonna be home. I wonder, I don't know. I mean, let's give it a shot. And there were so many eyeballs on the internet for April and May. I mean, it was just incredible. I mean, my business exploded. Yeah. That's so awesome. and yeah. Finding, uh, finding opportunities and, and kind of exploiting that. That's awesome. Um, you know, last question, and I love to ask this to every guest that okay. comes on. It's the last tip before we dip. So what's the number okay. one piece of advice you would give uh, to any um, owners, marketers, sales reps out there um, just kind of grinding and, and um, you know, from, from your pers- perspective? The number one tip. Yep. Um, I guess I would kind of maybe have two. Mm-hmm. One always kind of always be learning and trying to better yourself because you can certainly get to a plateau where you know more than a lot of people in your industry. Mm-hmm. But I believe in um, staying kind of current and and as much information as you have, you can kind of as best you can predict what's going to happen. But um, I'm a big believer in the decision makers need to be in the field in some way, shape or form. Like you have to know what's going on out there. Cause if you know what's going on, then you can empathize, you know, empathize with your, your team and you can really see what's going on. So if they're having trouble closing deals, it's extremely valuable to know why. Mm -hmm. And, it helps you see what the competitors are doing because you get real feedback instead of asking your guys, Hey, how was it out there? Oh, it's good. I tried, you know, but they weren't, you know, they weren't buying, but 
to understand what the market's really at. If you're out there in the field, occasionally at least enough to stay sharp, I think that is to me on a business like this, the most valuable thing you could do. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, we use a like call recording software so you can listen back mm -hmm. to like sales calls and, and customer calls, but it doesn't have the same effect as getting out there and getting in front of, you know, people and actually asking questions. Um, yeah. It, yeah. The second hand is good, but you can't rely on that. You got to go firsthand, um, you know, for a majority of the time. So, Brady, that's all the time I had, man. I, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, sure, yeah, it, uh, Fun. great podcast. And uh, you know, I mentioned that video I watched earlier. You run a heck of a, a post route. I'm not gonna lie. Was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you watching the one where I fell down? <laughs> yeah, I uh, I try to challenge like our very fastest guy. He uh, was like all all American and just so quick. Uh, yeah. I'm like, I'll challenge this guy. And <laughs> I made a break on him. We were doing something called practice in the park. So we wanted to be visible. So we were in our downtown park, riverfront park, downtown had a lot of fans watching. I'm like, all right, I'll go in here and break this guy off and see if I can do something. <laughs> I literally fall down. He starts <laughs> laughing and I get up and run and I actually score on the play. Yeah. So yeah. acting like he did it on purpose, you know? No, it's a great distraction. It's uh, I think it's exactly to use it. <laughs> more often. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's awesome, Brady. Again, thanks so well, much for your time and um, yeah, absolutely. Until next time. Absolutely, thanks. Great to see you and uh, good luck. Yeah, thanks.